The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed in the podcast belong solely to the hosts and not the hosts' past, present, or future employers. Hello, everybody. This is Brian from Breaking Down Security. This week, uh, part two of our discussion with... uh, Slack moderator page uh, talking about the you know, internal review boards and the academic boards and the patches that came out of the University of Minnesota added to the kernel uh, is going to continue. Uh, there's been some updates, obviously. Uh, it, there's a link in our show notes to an LWN.net article from a Jonathan Corbett or Corbet. Apologize to the author uh, on that. I wasn't sure about the the, the spelling. Uh, talking about some of the, the fallout for this, uh, I believe this person also sits on the the Linux board uh, to discuss uh, you know how things are, are maintained or what have you. Um, some of the takeaways uh, Jonathan had was. Uh, 42 bad patches out of 190. We talked about the 190 that uh, had been uh, considered. Uh, These 42 patches, uh, they are going to have to be reverted. Uh, The vast majority of these uh, reverts appear uh, of the 190 um, aren't what they would consider worth their time and effort to revert. So if there are vulnerabilities in them, they're so minor or they um, are not... uh, in in their opinion, uh, needed uh, to be reverted. Uh, some of these patches are in old, unused uh, drivers, um, stuff that's not really properly uh, reviewed or maintained, uh, or uh, nobody bothered to properly review them anyway because they were part of technology that didn't exist, like old ISA cards or, you know, systems like Wi-Fi Max or whatever technologies that were never implemented in the first place, for example. Um, Jonathan does say that 42 bad patches out of 190 is a 22% bad patch rate. Uh, Chances are a detailed review of the 190 patches uh, from almost any kernel developer would turn up a few that in retrospect were not a good idea. Hopefully that rate will not approach 22% though. Um, One of, I I think, his most interesting uh, takeaways was uh, one might be tempted to take uh, one final lesson one might be tempted to take is that the kernel is running a terrible risk of malicious patches inserted by actors with rather more skill and resources than the University of Minnesota researchers have shown that could be but the simple truth of the matter is that regular kernel developers continue to insert bugs at, at such a rate that it should be of little need for malicious actors to add more it's kind of kind of painful once you think about that it's like the malicious actors don't need to worry about trying to insert their own bad patches when uh, some of the metrics that was discussed about in the uh, kernel itself uh, currently, um, you know, there's already enough vulnerabilities as it is. So he states in the 5.11 kernel released in February 2021, in this case, has accumulated 2,281 fixes in the stable updates at, through 5.11.17. So if one makes the, quote, overly simplistic assumption that each fix corrects one original 5.11 patches, uh, then 16% of the patches that went into the 5.11 have turned out so far to be buggy. That's not much better than the rate for the University of Minnesota patches. So that's kind of kind of an interesting take, something you can take away uh, during our, our discussion here and uh, things that somebody might want to, you know, look at if you're, um, you know, working on a major open source project yourself. So um, if you want to read the whole article, link is in the show notes. I'd like to thank Andrew Healy for, um, you know, mentioning that to me on Twitter. Uh, you can follow him at uh, Healy IO, I think is his handle, Healy IO. And uh, yeah, hope you have a have a great rest of your week. They said, uh, throughout the study, we honestly did not think this is human research, so we did not apply for an IRB approval in the beginning. Uh, we apologize for the raised concerns. This is an important lesson we learned. We do not trust ourselves. Do not trust ourselves on determining human research. Always refer to IRB whenever study might be involving any human subjects in any form. We would like to thank the people who suggested us to talk to IRB after seeing the paper abstract. Um, do you think they even knew what an IRB was prior to that? 
I, I would imagine they did. Um, I, I would imagine they did, but you know, so I work for a company where, and I've worked at other organizations where you use a survey to decide on things like, do you need a pen test? Uh, is this vulnerability, uh, you know, or, or, you know, you work at a pen test firm, uh, which I have worked at and, you know, you have certain criteria and if you hit, you know, the flow chart of, you know, can you do this remotely? Yes. This whole, the whole CVSS process for vulnerability management is based on a flow chart. Is this remotely exploitable? Yes. Okay. Then it's a nine. Is it, you know, is it, you know, exposed to the internet? Yes. Then it's a freaking 11.5 on the, on the oh shit scale or whatever. Um, there's going to be ways to game those systems so that it looks like those things are not available. And if they're deceiving Linux kernel devs, why would it not make sense that they did not consider this to be human research and, and game that system where they didn't have to go through a lengthy IRB process? Um, causality equals that, causation or something. That's kind of, it, it feels to me a little bit like ask for forgiveness rather than permission. And I'm not saying oh. that's what happened. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, well, it was only after somebody raised the idea that they were doing deception operations here or, you know, you know, deceiving people that they decided to do an IRB. What would have happened at your organization previously, Paige, if somebody had said, yeah, we're doing all this stuff. And then we realized, oh, we're actually, you know, doing work on deceiving people. Um, what, what would have happened in the IRB? Would they have been denied to continue or, you know, because it sounds like the IRB gave them their go ahead and they continued doing this. It would kind of depend on how it, how it unfolded. So, I mean, with what they're dealing with now, it's going to have a major negative impact on their ability to do research. If right. you, so if you start doing something, ideally as, as either a student or a faculty member, you have a mentor who's there to tell you, hey, this is stupid. You need to get IRB approval. You are dealing with people. Um, I imagine in the NSF grant process, because this was related to an NSF grant, it oh. probably says something about IRB. Um, right. Now, IRB does talk about you know deception if there's no other way to do it. But penalties for something like this can be pretty steep, and it varies from university to university. Um, yeah. it, you may not be able to apply for funding anymore. You may lose grad students. You might lose, um, whatever grant or whatever monies are not yet spent from the grant of, related to these papers could mm -hmm. be yanked. Uh, so they could lose whatever funding that they have not yet spent, which could mean salary for the PI. It could mean funding for the grad students. Those are pretty big ramifications. Um, right. You know, anywhere that this person applies for a job, the grad students or the professor, this is going to follow them. It could have a pretty damning effect on the rest of their career. And that's, wow. you know, kind of that fallout from an IRB standpoint, they would at least get, have to probably go through some training about this is why, this is what you need to do, this is the proper process, this is how you report issues. But because this has blown up, I suspect there's going to be a lot of fallout. Yeah. Yeah. I was trying to find the, uh, the one thing I know we did not add to the show notes, which I will do beforehand was the university of Minnesota actually did reply to, you know, that we're investigating, uh, you know, pretty much the, the equivalent of, you know, we take security seriously. We take research seriously. Uh, you know, we're looking into this. Um, and, and I do know that the, uh, uh, Greg uh, uh, HK um, uh, from the mailing list actually did revoke or KH, I'm sorry, KH, Greg KH, uh, the Linux kernel developer did remove access to anybody with the University of Minnesota uh, .edu email address, which uh, when I saw that immediately, I was like, well, what if there's legit people doing kernel work or, you know, what if, what if he revoked the access, not just to the kernel, but to anything having to deal in the, you know, in the, in the kernel.org field, which would be drivers, uh, you know, I mean, how bloated is the Linux kernel? I mean, it's got everything under the sun and it is larger than some OSs in some cases. Um, there's a lot of moving parts there. And if you're using that email to commit or, or make legitimate commits and not part of these, these, these doctoral students, um, 
you've cut off an entire educational institution from contributing to a major open source project, um, which, you know, I, I think it was shortly after they were, you know, removing access that, that the, uh, the CS department at university of Minnesota said, Oh yeah, we probably should put out a statement. So. Yeah. It, well, and on like the Twitter statement, there are people calling for the prof to be fired, the oh, wow. grad students expelled, which without, without knowing what's going on with their IRB and without seeing some of the proposals, I don't have any opinion on that. Right. But I understand people wanting to see that happening. Um, You know, I'm calling for the issues with accreditation of their entire computer science program. And I think that's where this is going to get really bad because any, any research that blows up to this extent is going to have a major detrimental effect on the entire program. So you could be working in this department have no idea what's going on with this research team and now your career and i mean you've been screwed over because right. now you're associated with it or at least with that that educational institution yeah um okay where is the freaking link um and yeah of they of course humans are completely fallible now speaking from a developer point of view um it is really hard <clears throat> to read someone else's code. I mean, cause you can do things a hundred different ways. Mm-hmm. Right. And, you know, maybe I'm just a shitty developer, but it's, it's really difficult to read my own code if enough time has passed. Right. Cause you have right. to kind of people think differently. Right. And right. Um, like, why did, why did they do it this way? Why I would have done it another way. And, and, uh, um, I would think it would be very easy to do something like this and actually have it go through to where developers were actually uh, approving this um, flawed code. Right. I just don't. I just don't think. Okay. It would. It's like almost like shooting fish in a barrel. Like. Yay for you, you know, slow clap. Mm-hmm. Very good. Right. Yeah, it, I think that's part of the problem with it too. It's like, okay, you didn't you didn't blow things up for something that we didn't already know. Right. I right. mean, to, to people who, who actually know how difficult it is to code, and, and I'm sure most of our listeners have coded something, you know, e- even elementary, and, and, you know, it's, it's really difficult. And... So they did something that pretty much most of us on the planet could do and get away with, right? right. So, so you, you found a flaw in, in, in a human and you exploited that flaw. Great. Bravo. Right. So, so what I, so I, I, have, I have a thought um, and I've had a lot of them already, but so these IRBs are only by people who are in academia. Um, do educational institutions potentially reach out to SMEs in the, the, uh, you know, the greater org. I mean, how hard would it have been for them to reach out to a kernel developer at Linux and go, Hey, this is what we want to do. Are you, are y'all okay with doing that? I mean, this isn't like a a blind study. It, it, well, I mean, they make it sound like it was a blind study, but I mean, um, it, it would have taken them all of five minutes for that kernel developer to go, um, yeah, no, we're not going to allow you to do that. Or, oh, yeah, we know that this sucks. Uh, please don't do this to us. I mean, how hard would it have been for them to reach out and maybe ask that even even confidentially? It shouldn't have been hard at all for the PI to do that. Right. It, especially if they were already involved in the community. Right. It, you know, you got to wonder if... So for a deception study to work, you need the people to be... It has to be blind. People have to be right. ignorant to it. Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah. Uh, I mean, that doesn't that mean you couldn't right. involve the the lead maintainer, approach them and say, "This is what I'd like to do." And I think if you go that route, it may take ten times as long to work out all of that political stuff before you get started. But you're right. less likely to have a blow up in your face. Yeah, 
Well, I think the lead maintainer would probably have been loath to do it too, because all they would have had to have said was, oh, the lead maintainer knew about this. And then you'd have all kinds of political issues yeah. and that would blow up. I mean, we, we have enough issues get with paid. A, who the kernel developers or the researchers, yeah. the, the developers. I don't think uh, so. I, 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 I don't think so either. So again, you're, you're, you're attacking a volunteer. Right. So, or if they work yeah. for Microsoft or they work for Red Hat or they work for, you know, the Googles of the world or, you know, a lot of these, a lot of these people work, you know, at the, at the behest of a, a large, you know, company who is, you know, making contributions to, to the group is what I'm guessing, but at, directly for the, the kernel devs now that they, they're, they're, they're volunteering their time and effort to, to get that stuff pushed out. Yeah. And, and that's where typically in your proposal, you'd have some risks and benefits. And for something like this, if you've got a SME looking at it, there should be whatever the benefit is. I mean, identifying that something we know is a problem is a problem. That's not a benefit. Mm -hmm. Or it's not a benefit that's going to justify deception, typically. Right. You know, and then what is the risk to the maintainers, reputational, all that other things? There's no real benefit. And right. typically for research to be approved, there would have to be some benefit there beyond just a hypothetical, it could make things better. Right. So, so here's my question. What if they didn't know it was an actual thing? So I, a little backstory, I was talking to a, a post, uh, a doctoral student who was about to graduate with it. I'm sorry, not a doctor, but a master's uh, student. He was just finishing his master's and he was trying to get into the industry of data science. And just in five minutes of me searching, I had half a dozen jobs that I could have had a, used his resume to apply for, you know, a dozen slacks that you could have got on and, and done networking for. Uh, this person had not done any of that. And, uh, you know, he had weird, quite weird things like, you know, business analysts, you know, aren't data scientists. And he had some weird, weird kind of things, which kind of threw me off on that. And I apologize if he's listening, he probably won't because I asked him to. Um, but is the educational institute so insulated from the outside world that maybe they actually thought this was a real thing? I mean, we're on the outside. We are fairly plugged into Twitter. We're fairly plugged into the media. Hell, we do a podcast every week and we see all the doom and shit that comes down the line here. We know that what they were going to do in terms of research was shit. Are they so insulated from the rest of the world and from, from InfoSec and from open source that maybe they actually didn't know this and that was a lack of research on their part? I, I think the NSF proposal kind of shoots that out of the water. Oh, really? I, it says that operating system kernels play a critical role in computer systems. So okay. I, I think they've got an idea of the importance of them. Um, I, right. I, I might believe that they didn't really know what IRB applies for. Mm -hmm. And I certainly think academia can be so insular that the thought of IRB never crossed their mind before right. somebody pointed it out. Yeah, that's right. what I was thinking. Like, I, it, I don't know that it would have ever crossed my mind, but then again, like, I've not had to work. Well, and like, that, that's where the grant writing process should have caught this because. <laughs> it's somebody looking at this proposal if there were methods involved at all at at nsf should have been able to say this can't go through because you don't have an irb attached to it you don't have your approval uh and then going back through it i don't know that comp sci programs have anything in their research ethics or research methods classes about when irb would need to be involved so, so uh, for, for those of you uh, who are wondering what NSF is, it's the National Science Foundation, and they have a process. But so, so Paige, if the IRB at the University of Minnesota gave them a waiver or they didn't bother to go through the IRB process and they got an exemption because, you know, they're not doing human stuff, the NSF is just going to take that letter as gospel and let them go, right? Yes, I, it would be very, it would be pretty unusual for somebody reviewing a grant application to get a, an IRB exemption letter and go, what the hell, this isn't right. Um, right. I, I have a hard time looking at the research 
it, it could be depending on how U of M's proposal process looks, there may have not been anything in it that indicated that people were involved in reviewing the patches. Right. I don't know how, but I've also read a lot of academic writing that... I was going to say poorly written. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, academics don't necessarily write well. And there's often a lot of words that say nothing. And it's possible that you had someone that there were so many science buzzwords and computer words in there. And if it just talked about maintainers and uh, there may not have been a connection that a maintainer is a person, right. not a computer, right. but it's still, I, I don't know. I have a hard time. I'm trying to find a way that it could have just been an, an oopsie or we weren't, we messed up. Um, okay. And obviously somebody messed up. It's just, I'm having a hard time seeing how that got through. Right. Well, I mean, the National Science Foundation would have been even further removed than the University of Minnesota. So they only know what the IRB knows, which is what the researchers told them is, as I, as I, what I think I'm, I'm coming to, but um, yeah, it just, it just seems like that there was a, a definite lack of proper threat modeling in this case, you know, it's like, well, if we do this, what's the outcome? And uh, it seems like the the outcome was, oh yeah, we're going to prove that it does this. They didn't take into account the effects from the deception operations or, you know, what happens if somebody didn't get the email, oh, hey, this is really a shitty patch, don't commit it and, you know, then go on your merry way. Um, there's, there, they, they got some of the patching process, but they didn't get all of the patching process, including the time and effort to now revert 190 patches, which is, uh, some additional work that they have to do. Um, it, it also, yeah, I mean, the amount of patches that they're having to revert now shows me that something got missed. Uh, either the people had to, you know, go back through the 800 emails they got the day that somebody sent that, Hey, don't, don't commit that use this patch. Um, or, or what, but yeah, there's, there's, there's definitely a breakdown in, in one of the processes. Um, so we're, we're getting to, we're, we're a little bit about an hour right now. And, and I, I had asked, uh, somebody on Twitter if they would be willing to join us on the show and her handle is argv and she is a co-writer at Google of a book called building secure, reliable systems. And it was a little late for her to come on. So, uh, not late, but I mean, I asked her, I think yesterday afternoon and uh, it was a little, little, little late on her schedule there. So, um, she asked me a question or she said, here's a thought provoking question for your show. Is it realistically possible for an organization to build and scale a culture of code review that catches malicious insertions through one expert analysis or two, an adversarial mindset? Um, you know, uh, I would be willing to entertain any thoughts on that. Um, and, you know, I thought we might also talk about ways that an organization might catch bugs that are being unknowingly added, like what Mr. Betcher said, you know, the unknowing intention intended, uh, you know, bugs, but let's, let's ask this question first. Is it realistically possible for an organization to build and scale a culture of code review that catches malicious insertions? Malicious insertions, how? Like knowingly injecting like, patches from the dev or from, say, a security researcher or from a bad actor. I mean, we've seen the, the malicious insertion for me would be the supply chain attack. It'd be like what we saw with Solar Winds, where guy gets in, infects the dev's laptop, commits, it's trusted because the dev trusted it and it gets added to the code. That would be what I would consider malicious, malicious insertion. I just feel like that's a super broad question because there's a whole industry built around it. <laughs> I know. I know. I mean, like ideally, I think, sure, that's the goal. I don't know that it's, it's never going to be hundred percent. Are, are you just saying, you know, throw covarity at it and call it good or, you know, throw, throw, throw a DAS SAS. Because the question is how, right? It's just, is it possible? Yeah, I mean, is it realistically possible? Yeah. I, I, Maybe cost prohibitive. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Mr. Betcher, what about you? You're a, you're a filthy developer, like you said. Uh, you know, you're, you're, a, you're a company or an army of one developer. If somebody came in and said, hey, here's a patch, obviously you're going to scan it thoroughly, uh, I would imagine. But what happens if 
500 patches came to you. Yeah. See, that's the problem. Um, if I, if I write it, then I basically own it. I love it. I baby it, whatever. It's my code. But if it's someone mm -hmm. else's code, it's not going to get as much of my time. And that's just human nature, especially right. if it's just overwhelmingly a lot right. of, of stuff. You know, people aren't going to look at it with a fine tooth comb, so to speak. It's just not, it's not part of our programming. Right. So would you trust a patch from somebody that said, Hey, I, you know, I did a manual code review and I found, uh, this, you know, this double free or this use after free or this, this, this buffer overflow, or would you accept a patch more readily from, Hey, Coverity came up with this vulnerability. Uh, you know, you should probably commit this, which one would be more likely for you? Uh, I don't know. It depends on the situation. But you, so in, in the but case of you claiming versus how long it's going to take you to review each one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. So that's, that's the trust thing, right? It's like Coverity says that this is a vulnerability. Oh shit. It's Coverity. Mm -hmm. I better, I better submit this because Coverity knows what they're talking about because they're Coverity and it's a paid product and whatever. I, you know, I'm just Joe nobody. And I manually looked through your code and I found this thing, which one is somebody more likely to believe? Why well, is the Coverity report attached? Why not I just say, hey, this is what it showed? Well, I, I think in a lot of cases with those mailing lists, it comes as a, a commit a commit string or like, you know, where it shows the diffs, like a, a, a git diff or something like that. Um, uh, and with, with the commit message, hey, this was found with Coverity or something like that. And then, you know, somebody says it looks good and then it gets committed. That's, that's pretty much the process is what I'm, I'm gathering. I, I could be wrong, but um, that, that I'm, I'm, I mean, we're going back to the whole trust thing. It's like, do you trust the automated tool or do you trust somebody who's willing to do the work and effort to do a code review and say, yes, it's good to go. Um, or, you know, is it, which one gives you more confidence? Unfortunately, probably the human being. I think. Okay. And, and, and again, it comes down to our own self-interest. A, de a developer or a code review person is going to put more priority on the one that is going to benefit themselves the most. Right. Right. So right. whichever one gives them more notoriety, whichever one's more important, you know, uh, something to get their name in the, you know, eight point font or whatever the mm. cliche mm. is. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Right. Um, so is that is that how they generate trust? They they give you they give you a patch and it's legitimate and they fixed it. But in mm -hmm. this case, it was the people from the University of Minnesota who gave you that patch, Mr. Betcher, and they said, Yeah, we manually looked through it and whatever, and there's vulnerabilities. And you take it for face value, and there's you know, actually another vulnerability that they didn't know or they willingly put in that's that's pretty much what we've got here it's like yeah. oh yeah we fixed this use after free but then they introduced a double free or they introduced a buffer overflow issue um you're looking for the you're looking for the use after free which yes they fixed that but you don't think oh well they may have added another introduced another, another bit. one yeah. they may have introduced another one on purpose um, and the university aspect gives gives their gives them more credence right right and then once you say looks good they send you an email and says, oh, no, no, I, I ha, 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 joke's on you. I also yeah. added a, a use after free. Ha, ha, you suck. And then, you know, how does, you know, but yeah, I, I, I think there's a lot here in terms of, of, of trust. And I think, uh, I think the, I think the blog post from uh, Daniel Meisler about breaking trust is, is something that everybody needs to read about as well. Um, talking about, you know, uh, how we're, how, how trust is generated, you know, um, you have to build rapport with people. I, I think that goes back to the whole networking thing. You know, I can't suggest somebody would do a good job for something unless I actually know what they do. Um, you know, uh, been working with them, you know, looked at their patches, looked at their code. We're just a little too quick to trust in some cases when we probably shouldn't. And I, I actually believe, and I hope we can get her on that, 
the larger you get, the less likely you can actually have proper code review. At least that's, that's how I'm feeling. Uh, once you start adding the complexity of more than one developer, you start getting into the point where it's like expediency over, you know, actual, you know, security. But I could be wrong. And I hope that we can have her on uh, to be able to discuss that in the near future. Um, Cause I think that'd be a pretty, pretty decent discussion. Um, and I don't ever believe that devs will ever take on an adversarial mindset because they want to believe, especially in open source, that people are there to help. So. This reminds me of the um, where you send an email and if you get, you know, if you get someone to click a link, it takes them to a website saying, ha ha, you click this link. Um, don't do that anymore. Bad, bad yeah. Yeah. employee. We, or we call that fishing training. Someone. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, I, I would be curious if like legit study you could do after this would be surveying some of the um, devs to see if their mindset has mm -hmm. changed because this ha has gotten some publicity. Mm, that and would it's be convenient, right? Yeah, that would be pretty good. Maybe, uh, maybe I will email them and and, and ask them that question and uh, have a follow up because there's a ton of people on that mailing list uh, post. So I could I could reach out and go, has this changed how you take patches? Because there was a couple of people on that mailing list that automatically CYA and go, oh, I I I check I check all the patches that come through my system. And I was like, is that because your drivers for like you know ISA sound cards, which nobody ever uses anymore, or is it actually something that people use so you know it's that you know you get two isa sound card you know patch drivers and it's like oh yay i got work to do or you know it's like you know so. well i would say if i am still willing to participate then right. i will be picky about what i choose to look at mm -hmm. and it's going to take 10 times longer right so there you go right yeah and, you know, considering how software projects work, it's like, you know, you have deadlines. So this kernel has got to get out at a certain time and you need to make sure that your stuff is in. Uh, like any product launch, you know, we have to have these features in by the end of the month. So you've got five days as of the, you know, the 30th of April to, to get all your stuff in. And if it's not, you're going to wait another six months. And, you know, there's, you know, Security testing is usually the very last thing that gets done. Instead of three weeks to get it done, you've got two hours and you just take your, your best guess. Um, but yeah, I would, I, I, I definitely would like to, to talk to one of those devs or email them and go, what do you, what do you think now? You know, would have you, has your stuff slowed down? I mean, they did slow down cause they had to take time to, you know, pull them to 190 patches, but um, it has anything changed or will anything change because of this? You've got a, you've now got a bloody nose, which, you know, somebody punched you in it. And so anyway, um, cool. Uh, did we have anything else that we wanted to talk about? Let's see. Oh, I, I did like the, uh, did that like that link from uh, Duke university's IRB about using deception and research. That was uh, pretty awesome. Um, I had a new story I wanted to discuss about Emotet nuking itself today. That's today is in the 25th of April. So if you had um, apparently companies went in, some, some orgs went in, uh, law enforcement went in and busted up Emotet. Uh, let me see. Uh, yeah, I think that was, that was pretty much everything. Of course, we have a link to the register article about uh, Dan Kaminsky. So uh, any other last thoughts, comments, concerns, questions about the, uh, about this? I mean, um, I, I think, I think this will be interesting to see if anything actually comes out of uh, the Linux kernel in terms of process, but uh, you know, anything else anybody would like to add? Maybe I just they hope... meant well at first, but it was kind of deceptive. Kind right. of. Obviously. <laughs> it was blatantly deceptive. I, I hope it creates some conversation about ethical research in yeah. security in general, because there's a lot of stuff that goes on in security. That's a little ish when it comes to ethics. Mm. And if, yeah. if just at the universities now there's, hey, guys, IRB is a thing and you have to submit your research. Mm. It's going to suck for that IRB committee, mm -hmm. but I hope it would improve some of those processes. Right. Yeah. 
Um, you know, from a, from a responsible disclosure point of view, you know, that's a, that's an age old argument that we've been having with the, the InfoSec community. Um, you know, this, this, uh, goes beyond that. This is, you know, not responsible disclosure at all. This is, you know, something completely different, but yeah, it's, uh, I was able to, I was able to draw a little, uh, a few parallels there for, from, you know, security researchers who, you know, just drop an O days and, in, in on Twitter or, you know, um, going up in and patching boxes, you know, they're not, they're not introducing bugs, but they're, they're getting rid of bugs. I mean, is it any better if somebody was to go in and, well, I guess it would be better if somebody just went in and patched something that was broken, but, um, <laughs> I was like, well, what would happen if somebody actually went in and fixed something? I was like, no, that's what they're supposed that's, to do. That's a good uh, thing. <laughs> yeah. Duh. Sorry. I have, I have late, late brain. So, um, Ms. Berlin, did you have any last thoughts on this? No, I don't think so. You think there's going to be a, uh, be a need to, uh, you know, have a, have a reputation service for committers, maybe a, maybe a Yelp for software devs. <laughs> Not a terrible idea. <laughs> that could get interesting. Right? Pen pending. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, they just do they just let anybody join the Linux kernels? I mean, it seems like I, I, I hate to call it gatekeeping, but it's like, could I just walk up in there, throw a bunch of shit in the Linux kernel, and, and then it would get committed? I mean, I'm nobody. I shouldn't just be allowed to walk up in there and throw throw some shit up in the mailing list and go, Hey, um, my scanner found this, you know, fix it. You know, is there a, I mean, how, how do you, how do you, how do you create that trust if it's just not, Oh, he's, he's got an app, you know, university of Phoenix EDU account. He's probably good or something. Don't laugh, Miss Berlin. I'm an alumnus from that. <laughs> So, I mean, okay, what's the option? If, if, if the kernel developers tomorrow say, yeah, we're just going to put a moratorium on allowing new people to start adding stuff. What's the, what's the, what's the level of trust here? What, 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 do they, what do we start them out on so that they can gain that trust? Or do they have to put up a corpus of stuff that they're working on already? And then you get into interviewing developers to see if they can be into the Linux kernel. And then you run into know. problems with hiring practices. Right, like right, right. Well, Linux is no longer a hobbyist OS. And, and, and the Linux kernel is not like, oh, it's just something we can do without. You can't, you can't anymore. It's too fucking important. It runs too many important things. And you can't just go, oh, yeah, we're just going to let, you know, Joe Dogwalker off the street, just go ahead and put some commits in for something. So what, what's, the, what's the answer to that? No clue. Well, a lot of help you are. You're, you're like, you're like, I don't think there is a good answer. I cannot solve everything. Damn it. Why not? I will put it on my list of things to do. There you go. There you go. There you go. Well, um, I, I, you know, I don't have a good answer for that either, but it sounds like we may have to have another meeting uh, or uh, I would love to have ARGV, A-R-G-V-E-E -E on Twitter. Uh, uh, she's on Twitter and uh, she was the one who sent me that question, but um, I think that, that would be a good question to start asking in terms of how do we build trust for open source systems? Do we, you know, um, what, what does that look like? So, uh, yeah, if anybody has any thoughts or questions or anything, just, uh, you know, hit up the BreakSec Slack or, uh, uh, Twitter and, uh, we'll, we, we can always talk about it. So cool. All right. Uh, any, any last thoughts? Cause we are definitely over, but I think that those, those things need to be discussed. So cool. Okay. Paige, uh, how would people find you on, on the internet if they wanted to talk to you? Uh, I'm Paige and Sec on Twitter, and then you can always find me on LinkedIn. That's right. And on the break sex slash. And, she's one and of, of our course on there. She's one of our very fine moderators helping to keep the peace. Always there with bizarre gifs or gifs or whatever we want to call them today. Yep. She's right. She always runs around yelling, I am the law or whatever. I don't, <laughs> I don't know what that means, but yeah. Old judge dread reference anyway. Um, all right. So, uh, Ms. Berlin, uh, you know, real quick, because we did talk about this, so we don't like 10 minute, you know, post discussions here, but uh, real quick, what are you, what are you working on? Um, 
just finished my first in-person training for Wild West Hacking Fest. So that was Ooh. amazing, super fun. Cool. And we're going to do it, hopefully, if we have enough signups uh, in Deadwood, not, sorry, not in Deadwood, in Reno, Nevada, for their Way West Hacking Fest thing um, next. And then we're going to do the um, Hackers Who Paint thing. Um, nice. And I actually have a small amount of sponsored kits left. If anybody, uh, there's no tickets on our, on our on our Eventbrite, but if you know somebody that could use a kit shipped to them, or if you could use it, just let me know uh, somewhere uh, on Twitter works. So at Hackers Health or at Info Sister, um, okay. and I can get the rest of those out. Okay. And uh, InfoSec Roleplay is the other Twitter handle where you're doing your tabletop stuff. Yeah. At InfoSec Roleplay. All one word? Yes. <laughs> ah! uh. Uh, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to put you on the spot there, but uh, yeah. Uh, cool. All right. Uh, Mr. Betcher, we mentioned uh, we mentioned that you're a filthy developer more than once on this show. Uh, maybe you should tell people what you're a filthy developer of. Yeah, most of my time uh, in the development area, uh, aside from work, is LogMD, which is a malicious uh, log discovery tool. And um, yeah, I've been working lately on some, <clears throat> for our forensics community, some offline stuff. So that'll be pretty cool. Oh, very Log nice. Log-MD.com. Okay. Paige, you doing anything... Uh... You doing anything outside of, uh, you know, just trying to make sure that some K through 12 educational system doesn't get completely ransomware, which is probably a 25 hour a day job in itself. That, that does consume most of my time. Uh, that, my apologies. Yeah. Hey, you know, it's, it's fun most <clears> of the time. Yeah. My, my daughter had two school geodages this, uh, this week and yeah, it just made everything grind to a halt. It's just, yep. I will yeah. refrain from commenting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, I just started. My bad. Oh, shit. <laughs> it, it hits home because it's like on Twitter, the school system would be like, oh, we know Schoology's down. We're going to, you know, we're going to try to keep going. And my daughter's like, you can't do shit without Schoology. And I'm like, what are you going to do? It runs on, you know, Java and Flash. Uh, and shit, so it's real good. It's, uh, it, real good it, times. It runs on fairy dust and unicorns now. Uh, it, it, it serves its purpose. I am not be very diplomatic. You're, you're too kind. You're too kind. Um, but I, I would like to thank you for coming on. Uh, we do appreciate your point of view, especially from an educational point of view. Uh, the IRB stuff uh, was very eye-opening about how it, how it works. And uh, um, that was definitely a point of view I don't think uh, we had touched on or anybody had really touched on uh, too much. So uh, thank you very much uh, for, for, for joining us on that. Hey, you're welcome. Cool. All right. Uh, I'm on Twitter at Brian Brake. Uh, our, po our podcast website, the official site is breakingsecurity.com, B-R-A-K-E-I-N-G security.com. Uh, we're on all of your favorite podcast platforms, Spotify, Pandora, iHeartRadio, uh, Google, and iTunes. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, you can always check the website and check our show notes for every link. Uh, our T-Pub store has t-shirts. Uh, we, uh, you know, still have t-shirts and mugs up there. And uh, we are currently working towards uh, InfoSec campout. So we are looking to do a physical on-site campout in the end of August uh, here in the Seattle area. We're not going to have a ton of people because I only have enough room for about 30 folks. So we're going to try to keep it small and somewhat intimate. Um, We'll have masks and stuff, but we're uh, going to be outside. Uh, and I don't know if we're going to do a virtual component like most uh, groups are because I really don't want to be sitting in a lawn chair at a campsite moderating a Discord or any of that stuff, uh, which came up when I suggested doing all of the virtual stuff. I was like, well, I'm going to be sitting at a campsite running moderation on a Discord, which would suck. Uh, so we're, if we do the camp out, when we do the camp out, we're not going to do any kind of virtual stuff. So, uh, we're just going to, you know, find some speakers, roast some weenies and, uh, you know, burn some marshmallows to the ground. So, uh, if you're interested in doing that, go check out our Twitter at infosec camp out. Uh, so, uh, we'll have some more information there in the coming weeks. So, all right, that was it for this week on breaking down security. 
I uh, hope you have a good week. Go get your vaccines. Um, I got number one a couple of weeks ago now, uh, and uh, I, you know, I'm feeling better. I'm going to get my next one on May 10th, and I expect to fully take a day off. But uh, go get yours if you have the opportunity. Uh, stay safe. Uh, take care of yourselves because you're the only you you have, and we'll talk to you again soon. Bye-bye.